<laughs> Found my old belly dancing scarf a while ago. Back in Australia. Daughter gave it to me. Took me back. Couldn't resist the edge. How are we all? Let me get my uh, glasses so I can say good day. <laughs> nice shake. Thank you, Robert. I'm just being very silly. Oh, hello, here's Daisy. Here's Daisy, the wee puppy dog. Oh, thank you, Mr. Aaron S. Schaefer. Oh, Tomokitelli, thank you. New Zealand is lovely. I've I've only visited Aotearoa once, back in about 2006. I went to Wellington for a week and it is just divine. I love New Zealand. And the people there are just fabulous. They're the, uh, they're the superior version of Australians in every way. <laughs> so, as I say, oh, 78 of you. I just thought, as I said, I would uh, hop on. I was feeling a bit silly because I was my eye fell upon the belly dancing scarf, as it were, and so <laughs> I thought I'd give you all a bit of a giggle and shake a tail feather, as you say, and uh, pop on. Goran Friedrich, Danke. Thank you, Shane. <laughs> so, where are we all on a Sunday? Are we all happy? It's Sunday everywhere around the world at the moment. Sunday evening here. Oh, this is a new top which I picked up at the charity shop just yesterday, and I thought this shop, this top is just begging to be worn on YouTube. I think I might read some great expectations <laughs> in a while. For now, I'm just saying hi. And say, this is Daisy, my wee puppy dog. My wee puppy dog. Right. Ah! Okay, my wee puppy dog down. Whoops, there she goes. No, just allow me to grab great expectations and we shall we shall start off. We shall we shall begin where I left off. Let me see, shall I can I put put the camera there, I wonder. Maybe not. Maybe here will be best. What do you think? Maybe best here. All right. Here we go. Now, when last we met, I'm afraid the battery in my camera conked out just as I got to the exciting climax of Great Expectations. So. I shall finish the last few pages of chapter 15, An Intellectual Evening of Great Expectation. Robert, nice puppies. Thank you very much. I like most puppies, they have pink noses. Okay. All right. We shall start from where we left off. I shall overlap. Are you ready? 
This is Great Expectations, Chapter 15, An Intellectual Evening, from where we left off in the previous video where the battery calked itself, okay? So here we go. So far, as a recap, so far, sorry, I do, do forgive my cheapo glasses glistening in the light. So far, Philip Pirrup has gone off to express his, uh, express his admiration for Estella and uh, great gratitude to Miss Havisham and now he is on his way home after having after witnessing an altercation between his sister Mrs Joe Gargery and uh, Noah a uh, an apprentice earlier in the day now he's setting off home after that day's events with Mr Wopsle it was a very dark night when it was all over and when I set out with Mr Wopsall on the walk home. Beyond town we found a heavy mist out and it fell wet and thick. The turnpike lamp was a blur, quite out of the lamp's usual place apparently, and its rays looked solid substance on the fog. We were noticing this and saying how that the mist rose with a change of wind from a certain quarter of our marshes when we came upon a man slouching under the lee of the turnpike house. Hello, we said, stopping. Orlick there? Ah, he answered, slouching out. I was standing by a minute on the chance of company. You were late, I remarked. Orlick not unnaturally answered, well, and you're late. We have been, said Mr Wopsall, exalted with his late performance. We have been indulging, Mr Orlick, in an intellectual evening. Old Orlick growled as if he had nothing to say about that, and we all went on together. I asked him presently whether he had been spending his half-holiday up and down town. Yes, said he, all of it. I come in behind yourself. I didn't see you, but I must have been pretty close behind you. By the by, the guns is going again. At the hulks, said I. Aye, there's some of the birds flown from the cages. The guns have been going since dark about. You'll hear one presently. In effect, we had not walked many yards further when the well-remembered boom came towards us, deadened by the mist, and heavily rolled away along the low grounds by the river, as if it were pursuing and threatening the fugitives. A good night for cutting off in, said Orlick. We'd be puzzled how to bring down a jailbird on the wing tonight. The subject was a suggestive one to me and I thought about it in silence. Mr Wopsall, as the ill-requited uncle of the evening's tragedy, fell to meditating aloud in his garden at Camberwell. Orlick, with his hands in his pockets, slouched heavily at my side. It was very dark, very wet, very muddy, and so we splashed along. Now and then the sound of the signal cannon broke upon us again, and again rolled sulkily along the course of the river. I kept myself to myself and my thoughts. Mr Wopsall died amiably at Camberwell, an exceedingly game on Bosworth Field, and in the greatest agonies at Glastonbury. Orlick sometimes growled, beat it out, beat it out, old Clem, with a clink for the stout old Clem. I thought he had been drinking, but he was not drunk. Thus we came to the village. The way by which we approached it took us past the three jolly bargemen, which we were surprised to find, it being eleven o'clock, in a state of commotion, with the door wide open and unwanted lights that had been hastily caught up and put down, scattered about. Mr Wopsall dropped in to ask what was the matter, surmising that a convict had been taken, but came running out in a great hurry. There's something wrong, said he without stopping. Up at your place, Pip. Run all. What is it, I asked, keeping up with him. So did Orlick, at my side. I can't quite understand. The house seems to have been violently entered when Joe Gargery was out. Supposed by convicts. Somebody has been attacked and hurt. We were running too fast to admit of more being said, and we made no, no stop until we got into our kitchen. It was full of people. The whole village was there, or in the yard, and there was a surgeon, and there was Joe, and there was a group of women all on the floor in the midst of the kitchen. 
The unemployed bystanders drew back when they saw me, and so I became aware of my sister lying without sense or movement on the bare boards where she had been knocked down by a tremendous blow on the back of her head, dealt by some unknown hand when her face was turned towards the fire, destined never to be on the rampage again while she was the wife of Joe. So that was the very end of chapter 15. It sort of uh, catches us up where we left off rather abruptly when my battery died. And I shall go on to chapter 16 of Great Expectations. Thank you everyone for joining me. We've got 82, 87 viewers at the moment. How fabulous. Thank you so very much. So I'm sitting, oh, excuse me, I'm a bit caught up um, <laughs> with my laces. I um, I thank all of you. My uh, subscription has gone up to 30 and a half thousand subscriptions, subscribers on my channel. So thank you very, very, very much indeed. It's lovely of you. I can live with you in Egypt. Mamea Tucker, that's very, very nice. How very, very sweet of you indeed. But anyway, back to Great Expectations, shall we? We're up to Chapter 16. Thank you, everyone. If you're enjoying my videos, please click like, share, subscribe, all that bizzo, and click on the little bell so you get notifications every time I'm live. Oh, 92 people. We are doing well. Thank you so very much. All right, Chapter 16, Great Expectations. With my head full of George Barnwell, I was at first disposed to believe that I must have had some hand in the attack upon my sister, or at all events that as her near relation, popularly known to be under obligations to her, I was a more legitimate object of suspicion than anyone else. But when, in the clearer light of next morning, I began to reconsider the matter and to hear it discussed around me on all sides, I took another view of the case, which was more reasonable. Joe had been at the Three Jolly Bargemen, smoking his pipe, from a quarter after eight o'clock to a quarter before ten. While he was there, my sister had been standing at the kitchen door and had exchanged good night with a farm labourer going home. The man could not be more particular as to the time at which he saw her. He got into dense confusion when he tried to be, than that it must have been before nine. When Joe went home at five minutes before ten, he found her struck down on the floor and promptly called in assistance. The fire had not then burnt unusually low, nor was the snuff of the candle very long. The candle, however, had been blown out. Nothing had been taken away from any part of the house, neither beyond the blowing out of the candle, which stood on the table between the door and my sister, and was behind her when she stood facing the fire and was struck. Was there any disarrangement of the kitchen, excepting such as she herself had made, in falling and bleeding. But there was one remarkable piece of evidence on the spot. She had been struck with something blunt and heavy on the head and spine. After the blows were dealt, something heavy had been thrown down at her with considerable violence as she lay on her face. And on the ground beside her, when Joe picked, up her, picked her up, was a convict's leg iron, which had been filed asunder. Now Joe, examining this iron with the smith's eye, declared it to have been filed asunder some time ago. The hue and cry going off to the hulks and people coming thence to examine the iron, Joe's opinion was corroborated. They did not undertake to say when it had left the prison ships, to which it had undoubtedly had once belonged, but they claimed to know for certain that that particular manacle had not been worn by either of the two convicts who had escaped last night. Further, one of these two was already retaken and had not freed himself of his iron. Knowing what I knew, I set up an inference of my own here. I believed the iron to be my convict's iron. The iron I had seen and heard him filing at on the marshes but my mind did not accuse him of having put it to its latest use. For I believe one of two other persons who have become possessed of it, 
and to have turned it to this cruel account. Either Orlok, or the strange man who had shown me the file. Now, as to Orlik, he had gone to town exactly as he had told us when we picked him up at the turnpike. He had been seen about town all the evening. He had been in diverse companies in several public houses, and he had come back with myself and Mr. Wopsall. There was nothing against him save the quarrel, and my sister had quarrelled with him and with everybody else about her ten thousand times. As to the strange man, if he had come back for his two banknotes, there could have been no dispute about them, because my sister was fully prepared to restore them. Besides, there had been no altercation. The assailant had come in so silently and suddenly that she had been felled before she could look round. It was horrible to think that I had provided the weapon, however undesignedly, but I could hardly think otherwise. I suffered unspeakable trouble when, while I considered and reconsidered whether I should at last dissolve that spell of my childhood and tell Joe all the story. For months afterwards, I every day settled the question finally in the negative and reopened and re-argued re it the next morning. The contention came after all to this. The secret was such an old one now, had so grown into me and become a part of myself that I could not tear it away. In addition to the dread that having led up to so much mischief, it would now more likely than ever to alienate Joe from me if he believed it, I had a further restraining dread that he would not believe it, but would assert it with the fabulous dogs and veal cutlets as a monstrous invention. However, I temporised with myself, of course, for was I not wavering between right and wrong when the thing is always done? and resolved to make a full disclosure if I should see any such new occasion as a new chance of helping in the discovery of the assailant. The constables and the Bow Street men from London, for this happened in the days of the extinct red waistcoated police, were about the house for a week or two, and did pretty much what I have heard and read of like authorities doing in other such cases. They took up several obviously wrong people, and they ran their heads very hard against wrong ideas and persisted in trying to fit the circumstances to the ideas, instead of trying to extract ideas from the circumstances. Also, they stood about the door of the jolly bargeman, with knowing and reserved looks that filled the whole neighbourhood with admiration, and they had a mysterious manner of taking their drink that was almost as good as taking the culprit, but not quite, for they never did it. Long after these constitutional powers had dispersed, my sister lay very Ill, Ill in bed. Her sight was disturbed so that she saw objects multiplied and grasped at visionary teacups and wine glasses instead of the realities. Her hearing was greatly impaired. Her memory also, and her speech was unintelligible. When at last she came round so far as to be helped downstairs, it was still necessary to keep my slate always by her that she might indicate in writing what she could not indicate in speech. As she was very bad handwriting apart, a more than indifferent speller, and as Joe was a more than indifferent reader, extraordinary complications arose between them, which I was always called in to solve. The administration of mutton instead of medicine, the substitution of tea for Joe, and the baker for bacon were among the mildest of my own mistakes. However, her temper was greatly improved, and she was patient. A the tremulous uncertainty of the action of all her limbs soon became a part of her regular state, and afterwards, at intervals of two or three months, she would often put her hands to her head, and would then remain for about a week at a time in some gloomy aberration of mind. We were at a loss to find a suitably suitable attendant for her, until a circumstance happened conveniently to relieve us. Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt conquered a confirmed habit of living into which she had fallen, and Biddy became a part of our establishment. It may have been about a month after my sister's reappearance in the kitchen, when Biddy came to us with a small speckled box containing the whole of her worldly effects and became a blessing to the household. 
above all, she was a blessing to Joe, for the dear old fellow was sadly cut up by the constant contemplation of the wreck of his wife, and had been accustomed, while attending on her of an evening, to turn to me every now and then and say, with his blue eyes moistened, such a fine figure of a woman as she once were, Pip. Biddy instantly taking the cleverest charge of her as though she had studied her from infancy, Joe became able in some sort to appreciate the greater quiet of his life, and he had down to the jolly bargeman now and then for ch the change that did him good. It was characteristic of the police people that they had all more or less suspected poor Joe, though he never knew it, and they had to a man concurred in regarding him as one of the deepest spirits they had ever encountered. Biddy's first triumph in her new office was to solve a difficulty that had completely vanquished me. I had tried hard at it, but had made nothing of it. Thus it was, again and again and again, my sister had traced upon the slate a character that looked like a curious tea, and then with the utmost eagerness had called our attention to it as something she particularly wanted. I had in vain tried everything producible that began with a tea, from tar to toast and tub. At length it had come into my head that the sign looked like a hammer, and on my lustily calling that word in my sister's ear, she had begun to hammer on the table and had expressed a qualified assent. Thereupon I had brought in all our hammers, one after another, but without avail. Then I bethought me of a crutch, the shape being much the same, and I borrowed one in the village and displayed it to my sister with considerable confidence. But she shook her head to that extent when she was shown it, that we were terrified lest in her weak and shattered state she should dislocate her neck. When my sister found that Biddy was very quick to understand her, this mysterious sign reappeared on the slate. Biddy looked thoughtfully at it, heard my explanation, looked thoughtfully at my sister, looked thoughtfully at Joe, who was always represented on the slate by his initial letter, and ran into the forge, followed by Joe and me. Why, of course, cried Biddy with an exultant face. Don't you see? It's him. Orlick, without a doubt. She had lost his name and could only signify him by his hammer. We told him why we wanted him to come into the kitchen, and he slowly laid down his hammer, wiped his brow with his arm, took another wipe at it with his apron, and came slouching out with a curious loose vagabond bend in the knees that strongly distinguished him. I confess that I expected to see my sister denounce him, and that I was disappointed by the different result. She manifested the greatest anxiety to be on good terms with him, was evidently much pleased by his being at length produced, and motioned that she would have him given something to drink. She watched his countenance as if she were particularly wishful to be assured that he took kindly to his reception and showed every possible desire to conciliate him. And there was an air of humble propitiation in all she did, such as I have seen pervade the bearing of a child towards a hard master. After that day, a day rarely passed without her drawing the hammer on her slate, and without Orlick all all slouching in and standing doggedly before her, as if he knew no more than I did what to make of it. And that was chapter 16 of Great Expectations, which was titled A Mysterious Sign in the serialised novel by Mr Charles Dickens. Great Expectations. There you go. So, thank you everyone who has uh, tuned in tonight and said hello. Um, thanks for uh, giggling when I turned up the belly dancing scarf 
Thanks for sticking around for a bit of reading aloud. I am Mama Duck. I'm a comedian. I'm a writer, a broadcaster. I live in Ireland. And I'll uh, see you when you've got nothing on. Don't forget to click like and subscribe. And oh, there's links on my about page to Patreon. Please do consider Patreon or... If you go and find Smoky Emerald at the uh, fans page where there is only, then Smoky Emerald uh, bears a striking resemblance to myself. But you will also find me here at M A M A Duck at Mama Duck nine three seven zero is my channel handle. So make sure you click on the bell so you get notifications. Do be good, lads, and thanks again. I've got 30.5k subscribers, 30 and 30,000 subscribers. It's amazing. Thank you very much, and I shall be back with lots of things to look at. I'll see you when you've got nothing on. <laughs>